trains. They've been the backbone of Britain for nearly 200 years. First Great Western run the most complex fleet in the UK. Every little boy's dream is to become a train driver. Operating on an iconic network. It's an electrifying environment for me. There's always a buzz. Every day, an army of drivers, engineers and workers keep this huge train set on track. Coming up, managers are in the firing line of passenger frustration. We're spending £18,000 a year and just about every other person is on there for free. Right, trains in! No-nonsense station manager Teresa deals with the festival hordes. What have you got in there? Booze. Booze. And trespassers on the tracks take their lives in their hands. There's other ways of having fun. It's best not to do it near 125 mile an hour at 1,000 tonnes worth of steel that's heading down on you. There are now more people travelling by train in Britain than ever before. Right, guys, some of one of you not very out to go, are you? The door's going quick, quick. Trains and tracks are taking a constant pounding and record levels of passengers are increasing the pressure. Why aren't those trains running? What about our schedule? Well, kid of paradise. It's the job of a new generation of railway staff to deal with the challenge of meeting passenger demands. The train's been cancelled. Yeah, get the half past two on this platform. We're going to change in Birmingham. It's the end of the holiday season, and at Paddington Station in London, manager Matt prepares his team for peak time services, which are back to full capacity. No issues at all. We've got all the 180s out, we've got all the HST out, um, we've got no short forms out there as we speak. I've only been the station manager at Paddington since uh, November last year, so it's sort of eight, nine months now. Um, but I've been a station manager for about three years. I was at Oxford before in Reading, so uh, really pleased to be at Paddington, much bigger operation. It's going well, which I'm really pleased. Today, Matt and his team are out of the office and on the concourse as part of a scheme to meet passengers face to face and find out what they think of the service. Uh, so to meet the manager, we do something we do every three months on the station. So it's advertised well in advance, just an opportunity for customers to come and ask us any questions, uh, pass any feedback to us, and just and just meet us really and just have a discussion and uh, raise any issues. And they don't have to wait long for the comments to roll in. As far as the customer is concerned, there's no information at all. It's a bit that's any good for making a decision. Most of the time, we're aiming to give customers as much notice yeah, as we can. Sure. It's just a place, and I have no idea whether that means an hour or five minutes. We just don't know, and I think that's, it's that not knowing that annoys people more than... I'm sorry about that. How do you think it makes us feel that we're spending £18,000 a year and just about every other person on, on the, the three carriages is on there for free? It's certainly not all right, and it's something that can be withdrawn from them at any time they're yeah, travel. I know, but it's not. As if tough passenger feedback wasn't enough, for Matt, things are about to get a whole lot worse. A train has broken down on the main line at Goring, stopping other trains from getting past. Uh, well, because of the disruption at Goring, it's hitting everything that's coming into the station at the moment, so we're just playing catch up at the moment. We've had, we've had to cancel one train, which is why we've got a mass amount of people here at the moment. This disruption now means the team on the concourse are a direct target for angry commuters as now everyone wants to meet a manager. Well, we expected delay, so we're expecting, what, about another 20 minutes or Yeah, something. I'm just going to double-check for you where it is in a second, OK? Yeah, because I really would like to get home, you know. I came yeah. out to get the early train, and I'm now not going to be any earlier. Can I ask, why can't you tell us how long the train's going to be delayed? Because it's not on the board, and the inaudible announcer's not saying that. With passenger frustration building, Matt needs to find out where the next mainline service is. Hello, 7.30. Oh, thank God, I was going to get crucified otherwise. The bell train at Goring's gone now, so um, it's cleared the line. So things should start improving. Uh, the train everyone's waiting for, which is more than likely the 17.30, it's not too far away. So just going to get it in, do a really quick turnaround on it and try and get these people on there as quickly as we can. Just when everything seems under control, Matt receives more bad news and has to leave the concourse and head to the control room. The train that originally failed started up again after we detrained it. It's failed again, unfortunately, so we are going to lose a service tonight. 
So 748 cancel as well, we're getting crucified for. Well, yeah. What's their next available? 848. As a result of losing a whole service... Away. What have we got on the IS screens at the moment? Matt and the team need to quickly reorganise the evening schedule and reallocate the remaining trains. The trouble is, the situation is so liquid. Yeah, yeah. We said del delays of up to 30 minutes on services which we know are going to be a late boarding. So we can put a rolling message across the bottom. Yeah? Is that all right? Yeah. Cheers. We likely to have anything else cancelled. This is just this one set. No, it's just, I think it's just that set failure. All right. Speak to you in a minute. Yeah, cheers. With a plan in place, Matt heads back down to face the music. We've got some disruption with the mic, unfortunately, but <laughs> I know, unfortunately or unfortunately. That's bad luck, isn't I it? know, well, to be honest, it's good, because we're, we're here, you know, yeah. I'm station manager here, so I would be here anyway, but it is definitely going to be running. So we've got um, time for another You've got time for another drink, yeah. <laughs> okay, but thank you for stopping yeah, yeah. the talk today. All right. All right, thanks very much. Still suffering a little bit in alignment. There's still a, a lot of people trying to get home, so... We'll really do a break in the back of this before uh, 7 o'clock. Oh, yeah. yeah Otherwise, right. it's going to look terrible. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So, it's going to be a late start, that one. So, as soon as we've got that from them, we're going to walk, up, walk you up there and get you on that one. But for some passengers, this is the final straw. I've travelled now for three years, and um, I say that level of travel is fantastic with comfort, but level of consistency of travel is not good. I pay almost £9,000 a year for a ticket I can't afford in order to keep my job, but I don't think I'll renew it this year. At last, Matt gets the news he's been waiting for. A lot of clogged up stuff coming through now. Delayed trains have arrived and Matt is now able to start boarding passengers. So we've got two trains boarding exactly the same time now. Um, we've got the Bristol and the Penzance service. The reason we board them at exactly the same time is because of the disruption. We advertise one first. Everybody will be trying to get on that first service for Reading. They're both going to Reading, so we're trying to split the journeys, basically. So we're going to uh, watch this. It's going to be a very busy service. Please, to OK, if you want to go this way to get to Platform 5, ladies and gents, if you want to go around that way, you can get to Platform 5 quicker, OK? You can access Platform 5 around the corner much quicker. The concourse is looking uh, much uh, better than it was two hours ago, that's for sure. People are moving. They seem uh, fairly happy-ish. And, in spite of everything he's had to deal with, Matt seems positive. We had lots of, lots of comments, lots of feedback, um, lots of answers we managed to give them. Yeah, some good stuff come through, worth doing, definitely. Coming up, a trespasser brings the service to a standstill. The driver's come across a person walking towards him. As it stands, that train um, isn't going anywhere. Right, train's in! And the quiet of the Cotswolds commute is shattered. Anything you can send my way, I'll be pleased. This one's very busy. Well, Juliet 99, yeah. One place that's no stranger to the stresses and strains of a network at capacity is the control centre in Swindon, the nerve centre of the Great Western operation. Sometimes we're called brains, sometimes we're described as other parts of the body. Robin has been on the railway for 15 years and his vast experience has taught him to be prepared for anything. This is our London and Thames Valley area. Before you work on a railway and you travel around on trains, you wonder why so many trains uh, are late. And then once you actually start working on the railway, you don't wonder why, how many trains are actually on time. So it's uh, once you realise the complexity of it. There's no other industry like it. What's happening at the moment, Mark, which you're looking after? It's the Friday afternoon late shift. More often than not, the most challenging of the week. We shall see next hour and a half is when it continues to be busy coming out of Padden in the uh, East End and on the high-speed services. Right, OK, so, so he's walking... So he's walking towards you to start with, and then he's turned around and gone to back the other way. As the evening commute kicks in, Robin's duty manager, Mark, receives a phone call from a driver about a trespasser on the tracks between Romsey and Southampton. Uh, return to your train, uh, give the signal a ring, and we'll, and we'll remain on stop until further notice. You can guarantee that the one thing that, that always makes an incident kick off is, is someone putting their dinner on. So Mark's just put his dinner on, and sure enough, he's had the, uh, the, the first big one he's had to deal with tonight, so... Driver's come across a um, person walking towards him. 
uh, stopped the train. A uh, person's then turned around casually with the sounds of it and gone to walk away from the train. Still on the track, but as it stands, that train um, isn't going anywhere. We don't want to keep it stuck there for uh, too long. Um, look at diversionary routes, um, look at setting it back. Trains are on stop so this person can't get hit. Hopefully there should be uh, or relevant authorities on site to remove this person or this person might just disappear on their own accord. In 2012, there were over 8,000 incidents of trespass on Britain's railways, resulting in 41 deaths. It can take up to the length of 20 football pitches for a high-speed train to stop, but people continue to take risks. Some people would do it under the influence, some people would just do it as part of what they do. I don't think they realise really the danger they're putting themselves into. Drunks on platforms causes huge issues in terms of management of the individuals and the fact that they are very susceptible to falling on the track. If people do fall on the track, the best outcome is the fact that they might get a bruised head and therefore can be helped back up onto the platform. However, the worst outcome is the loss of life. People definitely act differently when they're with, with their mates and, and if they're, you know, they've been out all day, maybe had a, have a few drinks. There's other ways of having fun. It's best not to do it near 125 mile an hour, a thousand tonnes worth of steel that's heading down on you. As they still don't know where the trespasser is, Mark and the team must come up with a plan to get the train moving safely. They are after permission for the guard to accompany the driver because they do not know where this person is for the short section of track where this person may well be hiding now. Um, do we have authority for uh, the guard to ride with the driver to assist in uh, examination of the line? Cheers, I thank you. Bye. Bye. The train's going to be moving instead at a heavily reduced speed because they do not know where this person has gone. So that train's going to be heavily delayed now. These are the sorts of incidents, you know, which, you know, unfortunate that, that, that they occur. But if, if we can try and minimise the, the impact to as few a trains as possible, it's, it's beneficial. Luckily, this incidence of trespassing has had no serious impact. And whilst the team at Control are working 24 hours a day behind the scenes, keeping trains in service, three quarters of the company's staff are on the front line trying to keep the passengers happy. Here is your case. Thank you very much. And nowhere are passenger expectations greater than at Charlbury Station. Sitting in David Cameron's constituency, it has one of the highest proportions of first-class ticket holders anywhere on the network. Known as the smiling tiger amongst colleagues, manager Teresa runs a tight ship. I say you go out every day with a smile and a good hairspray. That's my recommendation. I found this in Eversham booking office in the back storeroom, and it's an original BR chair, and we had it recovered. I think most people that know me, they know that I like things properly done, and I like to be in control of everything that's going on. White line, platform edge, and yellow line, repaint. Not so much the start of Sergeant Major. I like things to run properly. I want things to go well. This is Theresa Cissé, station manager for the North Cotswold line. Can you hear me loud and clear, please? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. I can hear you clearly. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. And it's not only her stations that get the star treatment, her regular passengers do too. They might moan and groan at you, but, you know, they talk to you and, and you can put things right sometimes. And if you can't, you know a man who can't. Morning. You can jump on here. Thank you. Have a good day. But today, the station will be seeing a very different kind of passenger. Do you want to hold them and Kim will tie them? The annual Wilderness Music Festival is being held just a few miles from the station, and Teresa and her crew are bracing themselves for an onslaught of thousands of revellers. We were given a rough estimate of two and a half thousand. We were expecting more. And our locals and our regulars and people that come in and out to commute to Oxford and London, you know, that's the normal. And this is adding to it. Right, I need a hand with this barrier, please, somebody, just to get it across up the steps. Try and grab hold the other end. 
I've got the signs, away we go. Teresa wants to make sure the commuters are disrupted as little as possible, so she's creating a filtering system. I think that's a good place, but we are going to be instructed by her who must be obeyed. Right. One about there. You reckon? Yeah, I do. Oh, look at that. Made redundant. That's what I like. You've got work down here, Brian, so don't think you're shirking it. A quick check that the buses are poised and ready, and it's time to face the first arrivals. Right, train's in. Bring it on. We are ready and waiting. Hello. Hello. All festival goers along the platform, please, and up the ramp. Hello, welcome to Charbury. Up and over, your buses are waiting on the other side for you. Straight along the platform and up over the ramp for your buses, please. You need to walk along the platform and up over the ramp. You go that way, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello, how are Hello. you? There's a bus waiting down at the bottom. Hi, Jeff, that way. You're going to the festival, sir. Oh, there you go then. You can go that way if you live here. That went fairly well. I think our uh, regular customers appreciated that they were actually taken down one way. Hello, how are you? I mean, these are the people Hello. that I see every day, so to me that, that makes me feel good. But things are about to get a whole lot trickier. 900. OK, cheers, me dear. Teresa's received news that a delayed service from Oxford is packed to the rafters. Hello! This one's very busy! We're now waiting for the very delayed 15.40 service to Worcester Shrub Hill. It is running nearly an hour late, thanks to signalling problems around Hayes and Harlington. We are expecting an awful lot of people off this one. So we've got commuters mixed in with festival goers. Very, I'd say, disgruntled commuters by now. <laughs> Festival goers that way, please. You need to go up the slope, please. Teresa's funneling system keeps order once again, but the previous two services have delivered almost double the number she was expecting. I just need to go to the other side and see how the buses are coping now. By the looks of things, not very well. Hello, Danny. I've got seven... I had 700 people off two trains. Yes, I'm going to need more buses. Anything you can send my way, I'll be pleased. Are you all right with your stuff? Yeah. Sean, yeah. can we put some water out? We'll take some crates of water out. Hello. I've asked the bus company to supply some more buses because um, last year we had 500 all day on the Thursday. I didn't expect 700 on, on two trains. So we've asked them to send more buses up to move you onto the site. Thank you for your patience. Festival goers along the platform and up the ramp. Please. There's little let up to the packed trains heading into Charbury, but fortunately, Teresa's extra fleet of buses does the trick, and a record number of festival goers are soon on their way. All except a few. You are really struggling, aren't you? Well, give me that one. Give me that one. Thank you. Oh my God, what are you going there? I feel like everybody's mother, to be honest. <laughs> I suppose it comes in having experience being a mom and a grandma and my mom myself. It's Kitchen first, sink. It's our first festival. Oh, is it? And they brought everything they thought they could need. Good God. I know that at one stage I was known as Mother Teresa, so I think maybe the thing has stuck. What have you got in there? <laughs> Booze. <laughs> Booze. I might make a festival goer yet. 3,485 in total. It is amazing. <laughs> I'm very amazed, to be honest. I'm quite flabbergasted. I'm like, what? So it will be a bit of forward planning for next year <laughs> as well. <laughs> well done. We've done very well. We've done very well. At the end of each day, after nearly three million passengers have used the UK rail network and the trains head to the depots, the infrastructure is in need of some tender loving care. In charge of its upkeep are teams of network rail engineers, who each night are deployed to replace, renew and repair anything from signals to sleepers. It's now coming up to midnight on a Saturday night. We're about to get possession of the track from the signal at Exeter. 
Tonight, Steve and his crew need to replace two 18-metre sections of track on the Dawlish coast. And it's a race against the clock. In six hours' time, we have to have the track uh, back in working condition and then we can allow the signal to run trains normally. The track arrives on a unique vehicle that can be driven both on the roads and the rails. Many years ago, there would have maybe have been 50 personnel around trying to manoeuvre the rails. Nowadays, we use hydraulic heavy lifting machines. They do it more efficiently and reduce the man hours taken. The two rails need to be exactly in alignment. The right height, the right distance away from each other, and the right level against each other side to side. Within millimetres, they've got to get the two rails to align correctly. The track sections are connected by an ingenious welding technique. A cast is placed around the two ends and heated. Then a pot containing aluminium and iron grains and a chemical catalyst is placed on top and fired up, reaching a temperature of 2,500 degrees centigrade. The metal melts into a white-hot liquid, which drops down into the cast. As a result of this technique, the UK's rail network is effectively one continuous, unbroken stretch of track. After five minutes, we can take the majority of the excess steel that's around there now from the weld away. After half an hour, we can physically grind down the excess steel and the passengers won't know any disturbance or a rough ride in the morning. With the equipment packed away, all that remains is to test the points that sit between the new tracks. What we'll do now, we'll get in touch with the signaller and ask him to move the points just to make sure that they do work and everything is correct. This isn't good, mate. With the mechanism sticking and the line due to be handed back in time for the first morning service, the pressure's on. All right, do you want to swing them to reverse? Keep them going three more times. With a few adjustments, the points are working and the track is ready to be handed back, bang on schedule. Job done. It's gone very well tonight. The new rail is in. Good job done, finished on time. Weather's been good for us. Superb, all to plan. That's what I like to see. Can you get mine the step? Coming up, it's all aboard the Kebab Express. People tend not to want to kick off if there's two of us. How am I going to do this? And train drivers are put to the ultimate test. These trains are sort of 50, 60 tonnes. And if you're trying to stop that in a slight situation, it's very scary. There are 20,000 miles of railway track in Britain that year on year support an ever-increasing number of train journeys. Every inch must be meticulously checked, and it takes a pretty special piece of kit to get the job done. This is the measurement train, the most technologically advanced train of its kind in the world. On board are a battery of sensors, which are used to monitor the track as it rushes beneath it. Every two weeks, it surveys the entire mainline network and covers 110,000 miles a year. It's 4 a.m. at Old Oak Common Depot, and on-train technician Carl is preparing the measurement train for a long shift ahead. As test trains go, this is the most expensive we've got on the network. It's the fastest we've got, and it probably produces the most data. Under here we've got a set of lasers and cameras. What I'm doing now is just cleaning them to make sure that they're ready for the day's recording. This train will measure pretty much every aspect of the track, from the overhead wires down to the track itself, and even below the ballast we'll be looking for any anomalies down there. All that's left really to do is climb back on board, get the computers fired up now, and then we'll, we'll go and get testing. Uh, there's an order to turning them on. 
It's a bit of a dark art. Today, Carl and a team of technicians will be surveying the main line between Paddington and Plymouth. We've got cameras, lasers, gyros. The train's basically looking for twist faults, uh, cyclic, what's on a cyclic top, um, which is almost like a, a, a bumpiness in the track. Uh, twist where the two tracks are literally not level where they should be. Uh, and an alignment fault where the track doesn't stay nice and true or gauge where the actual distance between the two insides of the rails is too wide and the train would actually drop. Things that the public feel when they're actually on a passenger train. As the data starts flooding in, the survey begins. It's what's known as the track scan. It's a laser that's um, rotating underneath the actual carriage, laterally across the tracks. And these are the two rails that we are sat on. These are the ballast shoulders, and the ballast is the sort of foundations that the track is sat on. And this over here is the vegetation, etc., in what's known as the cess. Uh, that's on the actual left-hand side over there. While his team scan the track, Carl monitors the train's location. Up here on the top screen, we've got a HD video. These images are used for track patrolling. Various people use them to identify bits of scrap rail, vegetation if it needs clearing out of the way of the tracks. Uh, there's quite a lot of functions for that. On this screen to my right, we have basically the sat-nav of the railway. The red arrow is actually us to within around about three metres. It gives me full control to see where we've been. All of the instrumentation that was underneath the vehicle goes through the computers. The computers then process it. That comes out as a trace that you can see here. As a rule of thumb, the straighter these lines are, the better the track is. This is a development vehicle. These guys are currently working on the plane line pattern recognition. This is cutting edge technology at the moment. Basically using the same sort of software as Facebook with facial recognition. It's just recognising items on the track that should or shouldn't be there and just alerting these guys to process it through. If we found something on the train that gives us an immediate block the line indication, we'd stop the train and literally phone it in and get somebody to go out immediately to deal with the problem. With Carl and his team nearing the end of their shift, the data's looking promising. We will have found some long-range defects, if you like, with larger timescales, very minor things that need tweaking. But as for immediate actions, I've had a very easy day. Although we may not have found anything, that, that is ultimately the goal. We don't want to find anything, so I'm more than happy with today's test. But there are some problems that even this track examination can't prevent. As autumn approaches, railway staff and commuters alike brace themselves for the dreaded announcement, leaves on the line. Everybody thinks it's a bit of a joke, really, oh, leaves on the line, but if anybody's ever stood on some leaves and their foot is slipped, while well, they do that with grippy shoes on, imagine a steel wheel on a steel rail. These trains are sort of 50, 60 tonnes, and if you're trying to stop that in a sliding situation, it's very scary. The sticky pace the wet leaves create on the tracks causes train wheels to lose traction and service to slow. Last autumn, on the leafy Great Western network, passengers were delayed for over 27,000 minutes as a result. <laughs> so every September, just before the leaves drop, drivers old and new travel out to a private stretch of track to be trained in handling wheel slip. We're going to do skid pan training. Never done it before, so it should be a good experience. Mel has been training to be a driver for the last eight months. A little bit nerve-wracking. I uh, don't really know what to expect because I've not actually been on a train that slid before, so it's uh, certainly going to be a new experience. At Oakhampton Station, training manager Brian lets them know what they're in for. Well, what this is about is driving by the seat of your pants, basically. The first time you go down the line, we want you to brake like you'd normally brake for a station. On the second run, we actually tell you to put it into emergency and just leave it, and you'll see the difference. Enjoy the experience, and hope you have a great day. I don't think they'll ever, ever get in their career as bad as what we put here today. This is the most extreme they will ever experience in their railway career. As the drivers get settled on the train, Brian heads off down the track to prepare the rails. Now, this is the, the high-tech part of it. Drivers do say you can smell the burgers and the chips that have been cooked in it the previous week. I've used all sorts of materials, put in simulation of leaves on the track, you name it, I've used it. 
The drivers will make two runs, learning two different braking styles which they can use in this situation. A little bit nervous, but I suppose that's normal in this stage, having not experienced it at the controls. So soon see. <laughs> <laughs> Track to train, you are clear to make your first run. If you want to go into forward and try and get as much speed as you possibly can. That's it, keep going, pull the power angle right out. As you go around the corner, now you'll see the orange and white cone. As Mel approaches the marker post, she applies the brakes. start to slip and slide. Drivers do know about it because everything goes quiet in the cab. She's been instructed to apply and release the brakes, which will slowly bring the train to a halt when tracks are covered in leaves. This method is similar to ABS brakes on a road car. Right. No, I'm not one too bad. Good. It just noted that the train has actually gone out of sight, so that's quite worth noting. That was good. I suppose it's going where your gut instinct of you that's know it that it's, it's, it's going to stop. You're just not too sure in your distance. Absolutely. Track to train, over. Train receiving, over. You have permission to return back towards the station when you are ready. At the station, Mel swaps ends for her second run. This time, she's taught how to make an emergency stop. Mel engages the emergency braking system. All the wheels on the train lock up. The front set clears the leaves and the rear set do the braking. You can feel the grip on it. It's not sliding anywhere near as bad as what it was the first time round. There we go. Now you can see from that trip compared to the last trip, with a different style of braking, the difference, that's probably less than half what it was before. That could be the difference between having an incident or not having an incident. And that's why we teach them what we do today. If I'd have had a couple of hundred people behind me, I probably would have been a bit more sort of, oh, how am I going to do this? But this sort of gets you in the frame of mind of, right, this is what happens. This is what you can do. This is what the train's capable of doing, and you've just got to do it. As drivers prepare themselves for whatever each season throws at them, so the onboard teams must adapt to each and every service. Early evening at Bristol Temple Meads, and two of the most intrepid Great Western train guards are preparing for the most challenging shift on their patch, which finishes with the 2330 from Paddington, the notorious Kebab Express. We pick up everybody who's leaving London, been out on the town. We've got football on tonight, cricket. So the trains will be busy. There'll be a lot of alcohol about. Oh, oh, Chris. Chris. oh Chris, you're a star. Everything's OK? Yeah. Big buffet? Yeah, OK. Mark, get your kit and get off now then, yeah? Such a challenging service needs more than one pair of hands, and sharing the shift with Kimberly is an old friend and colleague. This is Maureen, just so you know. She's actually lead guard on here, the train manager tonight. I'm her second man. So I will be doing everything that she asked me you're to do. You're going to regret saying all that. <laughs> The journey to Paddington is lively and good humoured, with no hint of what may lay ahead. That's lovely. Thank you very much, sir. For Kimberley and Maureen, it's a quick turnaround at Paddington as they head down to the Kebab Express. No kebabs as yet, but plenty of burgers, it looks like. <laughs> But this train's not going anywhere until Kimberley's made sure everything's safe and sound. You have to carry out safety checks before every trip. Walk down the side, you check nothing's come loose, that your pipes for your air, for your brakes and everything are still connected. And as you can see, as you look through the windows, you can see that most of them are a little bit tired or a little bit drunk. But it's very calm so far tonight. This used to be a single manager service, but boisterous passengers have created a need to double up. You've got to have a good crew, so if anything kicks off, you know you've got somebody with you to back you up. With departure time imminent, the usual late surge of passengers arrives. 
Jump ready, yeah? Yep, first stop. Jump on and run through now, yeah. It certainly is. And we're going. As they pull out of Paddington, the Kebab Express lives up to its name and Maureen and Kimberly head out as a team. We always go through together. Yeah. Safety in numbers, isn't it? People tend not to want to kick off if there's two of us. I don't do this job because I don't like people. I do it because I do. <laughs> you have to come in every day with a positive attitude and hope that your day's going to go good. That's all. Mind you step down, thank you, and good night. There we go, lad. After just 30 minutes, they arrive at Reading and the first load leave the service to be replaced by more revellers. Yes, on you get, mind the step. On you get. And this service even has its regulars. The last one, the Paddington train, is one of the best. And I always hear this lady's accent as well when she's walking up and down the train. And I always know it's her. <laughs> they are always so nice to me, and I'm a bit of a loud mouth when I get on the train. We got but for Kimberly and Maureen, it's not quite the shift they'd expected. There were kebabs on here. We just didn't end up wearing them tonight instead. No, no. No beer chopped all over us. No. Um, Few no people. bombs pinched. No. On this job, you come in expecting it to be firing off. So when it doesn't, it's a little bit of an anticlimax, but don't get me wrong, it's nice. Back at Bristol, there may be a bit of clearing for the cleaners, but thankfully for Kimberly and Maureen, the Kebab Express is over for another week. Coming up, trains are a bit close for comfort under the largest bridge on the network. When trains are passing, they're around to, to travel in across your head around about 900 millimetres. The Great Western Network's last hurdle on its journey to Cornwall is the Tamar River, and spanning it, is the Royal Albert Bridge. Completed in the year of his death in 1859, it's the fulfillment of Brunel's vision to connect the capital to the far southwest and is thought to be his greatest engineering achievement. This 2,200-foot suspension bridge consists of two main spans that sit 100 feet above high tide, designed to allow admiralty ships to pass beneath. Last renovated in the 1960s, this Victorian creation is undergoing a huge overhaul. Morning, boys. This mammoth project is in the tender care of engineer Peter Cook. And it's a pleasure to work on such structures as this, a mere mortal as such as myself, uh, following in uh, Brunel's footsteps. It's a dream, really. We've got that full face mask and that, uh, Jarvis. Will you just, can you just trim me some steel? The main purpose of this particular scheme is to strengthen the bridge and blast clean and apply a full protective paint to uh, keep the bridge in tip-top condition. They're not bad, these joints on here, Amish, to be honest with you. You've surprised me. <laughs> Challenges are tenfold on this job. It's the structure itself, the, the way it's built, the scaffold access, that's very complicated, and the, the massive amount of steelwork repairs that we have, we've actually uncovered during blast cleaning. Currently, we've uncovered around about 8,000 additional steelwork repairs. It's very few structures where you can say you've gone from one, one county to another in the space of five minutes. Cracking view. Morning. We're just coming on to the main Devon span, so we're just 50 yards from shore. When we first erected this, this suspended scaffold, there were a hell of a lot more movement. You could, you could feel the bridge swaying in front of the train, and once the train had passed. But we obviously, we've, we've uh, completed the steelwork repairs right, right across this span now, and it's a hell of a lot stiffer and more stable. All these cross girders have been repaired. Just to, just to let you into secrets, that's an original Brunel girder, and that's what we call it a new cross girder. I'm saying new, but early, early 1900s when they were installed. The work continues around the clock and fits around the 60 services a day that cross the bridge. It's one hell of a challenge. It can be daunting at times. When trains are passing, they're, around, they're, they're travelling across your head around, around, around about 900 millimetres above your head. Uh, the timbers above his heads are only about 18-inch uh, deep, 
and then you've got the rail. 400 ton plus, just trundling above your head. It's nice to know. And all this scaffold, by the way, is just you just held on these little pins. So you stood on these little 16 millimeter pins all the way across the bridge. Just like that, you know. <laughs> That's a typical repair that we've installed. Dur over the whole bridge, there's circa just just shy of a million rivets, and each one's been painted three times by hand, brush painted. These are original Brunel rivets, so these rivets have been in since day day one, basically. The handrail, as it, as we can see it here today, that's in a later edition. Originally, it would have just had the the tow, what they call the tow bar, where the Victorians would have been just basically just stuck your foot underneath that and and held on with your toes. Not with as far as safety went, uh, working at height. A little bit different nowadays. Today, there's a special visitor to the bridge. A distant relative of Brunel, Philip Kingdom, is making his first trip on his 91st birthday. This is the first time that I've been on the bridge. A great treat. Looking forward to it, excited. Can't wait to see. See a difference in what bottom flanges here, like I say, with all these repairs on. It's marvelous to think this has been there all these years. Beautiful. Couldn't have been a better birthday present. That's really made my day. We'll never see another structure like this built from new in our lifetimes. I hope, personally, that uh, the works that we've completed on this job is a major milestone in the bridge's life. This is going to give it a, a, a new lease of life well into the next century. From Brunel's last bridge to the tracks of the future, the Great Western Network is set to carry billions of passengers to and from the capital. Use the doors down here as well, please. A well-oiled machine. Please take note, yeah? and out to the countryside of the south and west. Lovely, Gary. The best part is the customers. You get to know them quite well. As more passengers take to the rails... Use the full length of the platform. As long as we keep the trains going, we're happy. The network is evolving, undergoing the most extensive renewal since Victorian times. It really is exciting to be part of it. It's something to tell me grandkids one day, isn't it? Yeah. Keeping the network moving is the 5,000-strong team... Get them off quick. Get them on quick. Keep the trains moving. 24 hours a day. There's another big train coming. Try to keep things on track. We got the best seat in the train now. Absolutely. No matter what each day brings. It thickens your skin and hardens your chin. <laughs> Every day is different. It's the best office in the world. <laughs>